Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. And welcome, welcome, welcome to another awesome, awesome night of cyber insecurity. My name, as always, is Neil Bridges. And thank you for joining me today. Um, thank you to all our new joiners as well as our regular visitors. I got chat going on over on the screen over here. And I love, like, I utterly love watching chat and seeing all the new people that are showing up in chat. Um, you know, just Donald Snyder, uh, uh, Caden4, Cybermenti. Love seeing all the new folks in, in, in chat. Thank you so much for joining with us tonight. Welcome to all of our new joiners as well as our regular visitors. Real conversations with real people. That is exactly why you are here and you can't catch us here every monday wednesday and friday at various times right here on the cyber security channel we really are here to have real conversations with real people about the state of cybersecurity and really elevate that conversation to a much much broader audience now we do this because we have a problem in our industry where we don't have real conversations about the topics that affect our industry the people in it or the companies that we protect and it is because cybersecurity is an ever-changing landscape that our goal is to focus on multiple aspects of that industry and so what does that mean to you right neil you just said a whole lot of stuff and i have no idea what you just said to me that sounded like a whole lot of big words and i could only consume so much at one point in time what did you just say to me let me tell you what it means it means you you my viewers you are not out of your league on this channel no matter how many years you've been in cybersecurity, no matter your discipline Listen, when we talk about all aspects of the industry, when we talk about it doesn't matter your discipline, it doesn't matter whether you're a red teamer, it doesn't matter whether you're a blue teamer, it doesn't matter whether you do risky governance, it doesn't matter if you started as an accountant, started as a garbage man, started as a truck driver, it doesn't matter where you started, it doesn't matter where you are right now. I don't care if you've been in this industry for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 100 years, like our guest for tonight. I don't care. It does not matter. You are not out of your league on this channel. We are here to discuss the industry impacts of the current landscape and the art of the possible when dealing with today's cybersecurity issues. So if you are an experienced veteran, thank you. Thank you so much for showing up and sharing your experience and your knowledge and your wisdom with everybody in this community. Thank you. If you are new to the field, thank you. We're so glad you're here. We're so glad you're doing your journey with us. We cannot wait for your questions. We cannot wait to watch your journey grow. Whether you barely know how to spell cyber or as somebody who was born in cyber, this stream is for you. We're here for everybody to learn and participate from our community. With that in mind, we regularly try to have professionals from across the industry. I dipped my other old guy professional, and I got a next best professional coming in tonight. I'll introduce him here in the next stream. Y'all know his name. You guys are so excited. We'll, we'll save the high pants. Save the high pants. We'll get there here in a second, right? We do have moderators in chat. I want to personally thank all of my moderators, each and every stream, for their dedication. You can throw your high pants up in the air for the moderators. Give a round of applause for for your moderators they are here selflessly dedicating their time to making sure that we keep chat free of sexist racist misogynistic elitist and otherwise toxic behavior zero tolerance on this stream zero tolerance for toxicity in this community we are a positive upbeat community and my moderators are here to make sure that that positivity stays there i do trust my moderators explicitly their decision is final if you are put on a timeout or a ban you appeal to them not to me this is a fantastic time to to remind you to hit that exclamation point discord hop on over into discord that way if you do need to get in touch with a moderator you're already over in discord doing so if you're watching this on the vod you can find the discord information in the video description or in the about section for the channel they are not here moderators are not here to stifle chat whatsoever at all they are here to make sure that your voices are heard with that being said, I'll be answering questions on stream, but you are not here to hear from me. You are here to hear from our special guest who will absolutely be answering questions on stream. He's been here before. He knows the routine. Your questions are so important. And I tell this story, and, and I've gotten to where I tell this story because it's so important for everybody to hear and understand this story. Think about the thousands of people that are going to watch this stream live, and then think about the thousands of people that are going to watch this VOD or this video on demand in the next few weeks, in the next few months, in the next few years as it lives out there on YouTube. The question you ask 
not just impacts yourself, but could impact tens of thousands of viewers in the future. That's how important your question is. That's how important your contribution to this community is. And that is the prime value that comes from this stream being live. Nowhere else you get to talk to exceptional professionals like our guest tonight. And so take that opportunity and engage with, with, with our guest so that you can get your questions answered. However, we do have just one rule on questions, and it is such an easy rule. It's such an easy rule. We do ask. We make this clear every stream. We ask that you only ask your question once. That's once, not twice. Once, right? You ask it once. We have a team of moderators that is watching chat. They magically pick up all of your questions and they put them into a queue. And then as we progress through the stream, they pop those questions up on screen and we will do our ever loving best to answer them in our time together on stream. So ask them at any time about any topic, whether it's top of mind and we will do our best to address them. We also provide for you, I wanna say this, this is an addition to my normal script. We provide so many opportunities to ask questions, whether it's of me or whether it's our guests. Our guests frequently volunteer their social platform so that you can reach out to them. And our guest tonight is no different, and he's been very, very open about, about answering your questions. And so we do try our best to get every question answered as much as we can on stream. But if not, please please we will do our best to answer them post stream as much as possible this is why we make so many avenues available we do broadcast via youtube for our regularly scheduled broadcast um you can't find our videos on the video section here on youtube bottom line is hit that exclamation point socials and do make sure you follow us on all of our social accounts at the end of the day we are here for you to the community we do strive to bring you the most intriguing opinions points of view and conversations in the cyber industry every stream we appreciate all our subscribers we appreciate all of our members First and foremost, I want to thank our veterans for their service and sacrifice. Happy birthday to the Marines today. Happy Veterans Day to our veterans for tomorrow. Thank you so very much for your service and sacrifice, past, present, and future. I'd also like to thank our uh, partners in no particular order, Battleship Security, Attack IQ, Elastic, Query.ai, VMware, Carbon Black, Net Abstraction, Josh Mason and Cyber Supply Drop, and of course, At Root Beverages, who once again is out of drinks. They're that good, folks. They're that good. Uh, they provide prizes and discounts for you. As you can tell, we do tons of giveaways on stream. Every, almost every single stream we do a giveaway. It is because of all of our partners. All of our partners provide giveaways for you. So my simple ask is that you hit that exclamation point partners. You find one that you like. You find two that you like. You 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 use their, You take their free training if it's elastic. You you go at them on social media. You tell them you saw them on, uh, on cyber and security. That way they can keep providing prizes for you at the end of the day we ultimately do this for you the viewers and none of this will be possible without you and so our biggest thanks goes out to you i heart you yes you thanks so much we have been and we will continue to deliver you content as long as we can and any and all proceeds earned on this stream do go directly to continuing to improve the quality of the content and the giveaways now Without further ado, the moment you've all been waiting for, and I say this because because this man has been so like the, the go check out the cyber truth bomb videos that we have on YouTube. It is one of our highest viewed videos that we have out there. His background is amazing. We're talking about program lead at, 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 at Boeing, IT audit security at Starbucks, right? Director or uh, global security officer, uh, chief security officer at, at Symantec, global head of risk at Google, chief information security officer at this company right here at the Splunkskis, right? And now he's chief executive officer of Lucidum. Please, everybody, throw the high pans in the air for the one. The, well, who the, what the? Come on. Were you, were, whoa. Were you not, whoa. Is this, uh, whoa. Is this young guy night? Because I came for young guy night. What the? Whoa. That, you, what happened to, that, what happened? Are you okay? So you know how Root ran out, right? Uh, how? Well, it turns out you can not only drink it, but it makes a nice app. Well, I'll talk to you later. <laughs>
So, so I just have to say, I just have to say, for all the D and D fans out there, Joel, you have lost ten wisdom and thirty charisma with whatever it is that you just did right here. Like, I have no idea what this is. You look, you literally look like you're you're twenty years younger. I don't know that this stream is appropriate for you anymore. <laughs> I I appreciate that, but that just means you're the old guy. <laughs> So is that how that works? Is that how that works? <laughs> Joel Fulton, the man, the myth, the legend himself. Welcome back to the cyber insecurity stream, sir. Would you like to say a few words to our audience? Well, it's been it's been a bit. It's been a minute it's since been a minute. I've been together with y'all. Uh, and it has been a lot of fun. So watching, Neil, your stream as you have grown and the team here, uh, the supporting community that you see reflected through the LinkedIn posts, through the chat, through the emails that go out is awesome. And if he's if he's listening, I want to say hello to Nathan, who has now been partnered with me for about nine months. And it's been fantastic. Uh, so since then, we've been working hard at Lucidum. So we founded Lucidum to be the asset discovery answer. Asset identities, data, see it all, manage it all. And it's been interesting because we're trying to finally solve the oldest problem in security in a, in a plain, honest way. And we're picking up speed. Today we announced our Series A raise. So uh, I'm glad to be here to kind of celebrate that with you. Thank I, you. I was I was going to get into that a little bit. I was going to congratulate you. You know, that is, uh, for those who don't know, that is a huge milestone, right? That is, that's not like... You know, as much as we talk about how much money there is in cybersecurity, um, you've been at this Series A thing for a while. Um, are you relieved now that it's over? Yeah, that's really a good question. And I, I've noticed some of the questions in the in the stream, right, are, are focused on this. Um, the, the relief is kind of like when you take a water break during a marathon and there's lions chasing you. So were you relieved that you got to get that sip of water? Yeah, you know, you know I can remember like, that's a relief before panic set in and I had to run like crazy. So. What is um just just real quick because I do want to I do want to kind of talk on this. I do have the press release pulled up and and this press release is 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 super fascinating. This is a quote from you in the press release. Um, Our business is really ramped up this year as increasingly more organizations realize the necessity of cyber asset attack surface management, which I like the way that that is framed by the way, as an integral part of their tech stack, eliminating the need for outside agents and scanners. Um, then you go on to say the security market has always been littered with asset management attempts, but none have solved the problem completely for large enterprises. Now, this is something that you and I, for a year since you and I have been talking, have gone back and forth on. Can you talk a little bit about the challenge of asset management, the problems that you were trying to solve at Splunk while you were there at Splunk, and what ultimately compelled you to start Lucidum and try to solve that problem at Lucidum? Yeah, thank you for asking that question. Um, and so for those of you who are following and are in the chat, some folks have asked questions about how do you start a company and what's the hardest part? And what are the All of the answers to those questions really stem from how did you get a hold of that answer? If you start a tech company in order to make money and flip it, it'll it's an empty chase. Mm -hmm. You don't have what you need to keep going uh, to that next water station. So we started this with a real personal, uh, personally professional problem. And that is every time I have an incident at Splunk, it was something I didn't know was there. Mm -hmm. And the CEO would ask me, hey, Joel, I thought you were a smart guy. I mean, I heard Neil introduce you. He, he was pretty impressed. What's the deal? How come you didn't know that was there? And you all probably know the reason I didn't know, because somebody in R&D opened up their own DSL connection because they wanted to test something. These guys, they spun up something in the cloud. Those folks, well, she had a deal at Apple and they all bought a bunch of Macs and they brought them into our network. And now I've got BYOD, Shadowclad, Stealth IT, new egress to the internet I didn't know was there. And how was I supposed to know it? Mm -hmm. And so when I researched to how to solve this problem by applying it, is how how can I find it? Well, one aspect is we play Marco Polo. You remember when you were a kid, right? You blindfolded the pool, Marco Polo, trying to find it. That is doing OS fingerprint scans of your network. Ephemeral assets don't last that long. Did you time them right? Things change all the time. IP addresses are dynamically assigned. Those scanners, they don't solve it 
for me. Mm -hmm. And agents don't work either because people blow them away. So are you serious? I can't know what's in my environment. There's literally no way for me to know what's in my enterprise. That's the condition that we're in. Yeah. So that is what fueled the fire to solve this in a totally different way. And 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 I and asset management is one of those things that that nobody gets right. Like I've I've been to more organizations than I can count, and asset management is beyond a doubt a problem. Um, I want to pivot on you here just a little bit, and I want to kind of talk about you mentioned Nathan. Right. And yeah. I want to and I want to I want to rehash a little bit for our community, especially the new folks who may not have um, have been here when you and I did this a couple months back. So so I actually went back, check the tape. This was back in February. Um, Joel came on for his Q1 appearance back in February. And this was um, I had yet to announce that I was going to take chief content officer role at INE. And Joel had been instrumental in kind of my conversation to try to make sure that this was the right move for me as I was going to do that. And so Joel had kind of inside knowledge that I was taking that role. So Joel came on stream on an old guy Wednesday and uh, we get towards the end of the stream and Joel's like, I'm gonna ask you a question that you have yet to tell your community and I want you to tell your community. And I said, absolutely. But I'm gonna ask you that if I answer that question, if, if, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna answer that qu question, you have to give an internship to somebody in the community. In junior high, we called this "I'll show you mine." If you show me yours. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And so Joel bit, Joel bit, and so we um uh, I, I announced on, on that stream that I was taking the chief content officer at INE role, and Joel. We raffled off a internship for Lucidum, and um, Nathan um, Com Bombadil in chat. Um, if you see him in chat, he won the internship, and that's who's been working with Joel for the last nine months. So I say all that, Joel, to say you obviously had internships at Splunk. You had an internship program, obviously at Semantic and some of the other organizations that you worked at. You obviously weren't prepared for this at Lucidum. And then you had to do it in the midst of all the other challenges that you've got coming on with starting your 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 uh, your company up. What did you learn? Well, um, thank you for the generosity. Assuming I can learn. <laughs> so, uh, you like what I love about coming on with you and spending time with you, on or, or off, right? Is um, let's just cut through all the other stuff and get down to like the truth of what's underneath. Yeah. And, and the fact is, the fact is wrong. In my experience, my perception of all of the internship programs that I have been a part of, Boeing, Starbucks, financial institutions, Google, Symantec, Jefferson Wells, Splunk, all of them, none of them are ready. Because what you really, really want out of an internship program as the intern is you want to step into a program that's got well-defined roles. It's got maybe some sort of a practical curriculum where every week or every quarter I'm learning something new as I move my way, kind of like an apprentice into journeyman skills in this specific area that I know I'm interested in. But that's not how it works. <laughs> well, it is. Because here's what happens when you're at a big corporation. You, you get the email that comes around from HR that says, hey, if you'd like an intern, um, list how many you'd like on this sheet. <laughs> okay, cool. What do you guys think? Two, three, four? You know they're going to say no to half. Okay, we'll, we'll take eight. <laughs> we'll take eight. And you put it on the list, and then the intern committee comes back and says, you get two. Sweet. Hey, who wanted interns again? And nobody remembers. Right? <laughs> and, and then a couple new people show up like, yeah, we wanted interns, you bet. How many we got? We got two. Oh, well, I don't need one then. Oh, well, I'll take the two. And, and then by the time the intern arrives, it is panic time inside because you don't want to embarrass the company. You don't want them to show up and have nothing to do, but you really don't have anything for them to do. And HR is going to measure you based on some KPIs, NPS, that you're not really sure what those acronyms mean, but you know it's going to show up on your 360. So quick, Neil, your job this week is to figure out what we do with our interns, all right? And if you need a week, we can stall by teaching them, uh, like let's put them through all of our security awareness training. 
Yeah. And then, hey, they're younger, uh, so let's have them critique it. Yeah, that's an assignment and an essay. That'll take another week. So two weeks. <laughs> we got two weeks to breathe. That's what we do with our interns. And, and that's kind of the way it, it, it works. And it's not what either side wanted, but it's the collision that tends to, to happen. Mm -hmm. So with Nathan, who, uh, Nathan, if you're there, come Bombadil, greetings. Uh, he's been fantastic um, because he took... Um, 100% ownership of the internship. Mm. And so what that means is like, you know, it's that people say, we each got to give 50-50. And that's really um, not enough. Because what that means is on average, you're contributing 50 all, all in. Right? Yeah. Because one day I'm off and you're on. So we're at 50. Um, but he did a good job going all in. And so he uh, made that internship what it needed. And I did everything I knew to do to meet him there. Mm. And uh, mm -hmm. it's probably more important to hear what he thinks about it. But the experience on my side has been fantastic. What, so, what, what is, I think that, I think the important part of that is, whoops, a little bit of feedback on your end. Um, there we go. Awesome. Um, I think the important part to take away from that though was, you, you took your corporate learnings of an internship program, right? And tried to not do that again in your own company. If that's fair, how do you think that that's going to shape your next round of interns? Uh, it is. Well, so uh, I'm going to bring these two conversations together. <laughs> so um, when you do a startup, <laughs> The first thing that you have to you feel you feel, you feel that burn that's that's what we refer to as the hot seat. Yeah, I like it. I, no, I love it. I love it. So, <laughs> like, hey, um, let's not be truthful. Let's be fantastic for a little bit and pretend. Yeah. No, let's let's stay where we are. <laughs> so, uh, the the pressure you get when you're a startup is the pressure that's the legacy of a corporate environment where everything has to be scalable. And so what you do as a startup is 100% not scalable. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be scalable because scalable means automation of a known good quantity or characteristic, but you don't know what those characteristics are. And so if you scale ignorance now, you are putting acceleration to stupidity. Mm -hmm. So you don't scale, you iterate, you try little small things. And so that's what, that's the label I would apply to the relationship, including work over the last nine months between Nathan and I, is it has been iterative, it is not scalable, and it's been valuable. So wh what are the lessons learned from the next one? I think make it personal and do it that way again. Mm -hmm. Because there is no internship program. There's an internship that is built around the needs and desires of both parties, and so that both agree that the outcome that they're headed toward is the right outcome. So, so we've got a con convertee here in chat with a question that popped up. The PR guy says, wow, he just, uh, he's just speak the truth about internships. That is why I am so afraid of the internship process. Um, yeah. I can, I can concur with Joel on this one. Like what Joel talks about, um, at every big company I've been at, that is exactly how an internship program works, right? Is, is you legitimately are like, how many interns would you like? Well, here's my aspirational number. You might get half, you might get a quarter. And then yes, you totally forgot that you asked for internships. You have no idea what you're going to do with it. You don't have a program and you're given people and you're like, shoot, what do I do with these people? Right? Um, what would you say now that you've been on both sides of internships, how does one find good quality internships or what characteristics do you think make good quality internships? So I will go back to the, I think there's like a generational thing in, in interns, old school internship. I think about Boeing and Boeing had recipes for interns. The difficulty with that is if you didn't like the fit, they weren't going to change anything about the fit. Now we've gotten to this nebulous piece where internships, whatever you'd like it to be. Well, I don't know, what would you like it to be? It's like it's like a bad, bad run. But you can you make it better. You can make it make it to your own by know what you want out of it. Like, like the, 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 the PR guy, PR guy. Uh, your, your, your content gives you, gives you a you hey, hey real, real quick joel real quick we're getting that same echo that we got before during pre-roll let me let me uh headphone up um what we'll wait for we'll wait for joel to
Alright, alright. Nope. 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 Oh no! Alright. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nathan! Nathan, he needs some help with his, his audio setup. <laughs> Yeah, you know, the, the irony is Nathan's actually good at audio setups. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we're gonna work. We'll put you. We'll put. Uh, we'll put you back over in the green room just real quick while you reset uh, that one. Um, if you want to leave and come back in, I'm not sure if that'll that'll help or not. But um, you know, kind of back to that original question. That that very much is has been my experience as well. Um, you know, with with internships, and and I think one of the biggest one of the ways that we tried to solve that at Abbott was we tried to actually bake in an actual real internship program that actually had, um, you know, goals and objectives and a learning plan that was associated with it um, to try to make that uh, uh, make that more successful. Let's uh, let's see if that was stalled enough for Joel to come back in. Check one, check two. Better All right. Worse. Awesome. Good. Whew, I saw for right. you. Nobody moved. Nobody, Nobody moved, moved a muscle. <laughs> it's working now. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. So back to the question of how would one go about, um, how would one go about um, uh, finding a good internship program or what characteristics look for a good internship program? Yeah, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read the last half of yeah. the PR guy's comment. That is why I'm so afraid of the internship process. Now, forgive me for being a little meta, and uh, but I think this is important. Once you see the truth of the situation, you have the opportunity to no longer be afraid of that situation. People are afraid of the dark because it's the unknown that's going to bite you. And this isn't a lucid commercial. But once you see what that internship actually is, you cannot like it, but you don't have to be afraid anymore because now you see the dynamics. Now you know the, the physics of that universe. And that allows you to aim your weapons and be aggressive about it. There's this, uh, there's this guy who's Hungarian, his name was Laszlo Polgar, who wrote a book called Raise a Genius! Exclamation point. And this book was an exhor exhortation to you raise geniuses. And how do you raise geniuses? And one of the things that he elucidates in this book is people learn best when they are relaxed, playful, and aggressive. Now put those three qualities together and think about for yourself, when's the last time I felt relaxed, playful, and aggressive? My guess is playing a game, playing a competitive mm -hmm. game mm -hmm. with friends. So now look at this internship process that looks kind of ugly. It looks like it's set up against you. It looks like people aren't ready for you and no one's making a way. Now, how would you in a relaxed, playful and aggressive way tackle that problem? Well, you know where there's no vision, people are willing to be led. So you show up on day one and say, I'm glad to be your intern. There's six things that I'm after and I've looked at your LinkedIn bio and I believe you can check two of those things off the box for me. And because I've got access to the org chart, would you introduce me to these two folks? Because I'd like to spend three days each with them and then I can come back to you and tell, me what, tell you what I've learned and I want to take it. To, like you can lead your internship. Hmm. So when I described earlier that one thing that Nathan did that made this a good experience for me is he contributed 100% towards it. That's what I mean by contribute 100%. Suppose they do anything you want for your internship then act on that interesting interesting it's it it, it really gets it gets it gets around to just you know don't expect an internship to solve your problems for you take ownership of your responsibility in that internship and i think we've talked about that we talked about that a couple times on stream before when we talked about mentorship right i think mentorship is another one of those examples where you have to talk about what can you contribute or what can you give back to your mentor as much as what your mentor can give over to the mentee and i think that that's that's probably a, a key recipe that folks should take away is that you know it's not it's hard to sell an internship and it's hard to sell a mentorship when you're asking and expecting to be given things all the time. Is that fair? That's right. A absolutely. Like my key tip would be when you show up to propose that internship, lead with the fact you have a certified ethical hacker certificate. That could, that blows down a lot of doors mm -hmm. and really opens things up for you. 
We'll we'll leave that one. We'll leave that one be for for now. <laughs> uh, Requiem twenty ninety nine comes through and says, "Is a traditional internship even worth your time in twenty twenty one? Not a Neil Black Hills Information Security etc. internship, but like a PwC Deloitte KPMG EY um, yada yada yada. So so more of the traditional internship type programs. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would agree uh, with that. Fit fit yourself to the internship." I think um, I think the 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 way that I would reframe that question for you is, what is the value of an internship at? Oh God, this is going to sound horrible. Um, probably one of those more cattle call based internship operations, like a big four or something like that. What is when people hear about internships, like what Nathan went through? When people hear about internships, like what my interns went through, right, and things like that, and they hear about the cattle call internships, like what you've got at some of the big four. What's the advantage of going through some of those internship programs versus maybe going through like one of ours? I think there's immense advantages. Um, so I'm a, I'm an autodidact and only people that are autodidacts know what autodidact means. It means you're self-taught. So I, I went to college late in life. This is a good story. So, this is a good story for everybody here. If you've not watched cyber truth bombs, this is key to understand about Joel's history. Yeah, go, we, we get a little personal as we work our way through a bottle of, uh, of whiskey. Mm -hmm. But the, the relevance of this to now is uh, when you teach yourself to teach yourself, then you judge harshly poor teachers. And so if you took me and put me into one of those cattle call internships, I would have a difficult time absorbing useful information because I would be heightened in my critique mm -hmm. about how bad they are at doing their job. And that's, that's, a, that's on me, that is a fault. If I could choose to turn that off and I could absorb every bit of nutrition from that environment, I would be much better off. So if however, you're not, and you work really well with classical approaches to education and you walk into that environment or you know what you need to get out of it. I wanna know how these big four people talk, walk, move, eat, act. And I wanna learn everything about this. That autodidact can do that, so go with a goal. But in both of these, you pointed out something, uh, Neil, that I don't think should be overlooked. And that is, don't look for somebody to do your career for you. Mm. Go to that internship with, I'm here at the buffet, I get to choose what to eat. I'm going to eat what's good for me, here's my plan. Rather than, what are they going to serve me? It'll make a difference. I think that that's definitely key right there is, is that perspective idea that you're talking about. Um, Sat comes through, says, um, question, can interns be remote and how can we learn from it or is it just do the work and shut up? That sounds like somebody who may have, have had a bad internship experience or is fearful of the internship experience. Is, is remote internships possible in a post-COVID world or maybe even in a, in a, in a pre-COVID world? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would, for those of, of you that this is appropriate, when you are remote, make sure people don't know you're remote. Mm. And let's let's elaborate that on that a little bit, right? That's a that's a great punchline, and and we'll definitely clip that and put that up on YouTube later. Um, but what does that mean? So make certain that you're in everybody's business when you're remote and no one else is, so, so put that scenario in your head, I'm the only remote person. Now I have a chip on my shoulder. I'm, no one's gonna wake up before me. No one is gonna log off before I do. I'm gonna be in every chat, in every meeting, and I'm never gonna complain, and my camera's always gonna work, and my sound's always gonna, well, okay, we'll skip over the sound part. Uh, because I want people to not know I'm remote. Mm -hmm. So can you be a remote intern? Yes, it's my job as the intern to make sure this is crushed and I'm killing it and nobody knows. And think about how you'd stand out in a world where everybody is, I don't, I don't understand, but it's exhausting to be remote and, and I, just, I just couldn't drag myself out of bed across the hallway to my camera today <laughs> to log on to this meeting with HR about that. And you're the one person showing up, bright, shiny, popping dirt, and you're after it. How do you think you'll stand out? So yes, you can intern remote. I, I, I think that that's, I, I, I love that mentality, right? Because we, we oftentimes 
think too much like i've had people critique me for the hustle sign over my shoulder here right like oh i hate that hustle mentality because we're, we're teaching people you know that work-life balance isn't important and that if you hustle you'll get everything you want and i don't think that that's the point at all i think the point is exactly what you're talking about right if you're an intern you're trying to make an impact if you're an intern you're trying to get a job if you're an intern you're trying to show that you bring value to an organization and so i think that it's important for you to embody and display that mentality so that to your point, you know, Nathan owned the internship for the last nine months and made it what it is, hopefully that turns into something more fortuitous for him in the future. You know, if you're a remote intern, show up before everybody else, have the camera on, have the audio on, right? That type of mentality, it becomes that, you know, stop thinking that, you know, the company is there to service you, you're there to service the company as well. Yeah, I, uh, so your hustle banner, Napoleon would have loved it. <laughs> that, so, like, I don't know if that's a compliment or not. I, that, that, I mean, because I'm short. I, I'm short. <laughs> 100%. So first of all, Napoleon wasn't short. Uh, second, uh, you know, we all know he was exiled to the island of Elba. Yeah. But what we don't know is while he was exiled there, he over, overthrew a tyranny, set up a hospital, created a democracy, created a library, and published books. So the dude's in prison. And he's setting up a library, building a hospital, and creating a democracy while he's in prison on the island. Busy, active, pushing. Yeah. No one was, he wasn't, and no one's helping Napoleon. He's here to change all of this and to make it the way it ought to be. Now, what he thought it all ought to be may not be what you think it all ought to be. But if he outworks you, he wins. Hustle. I'm going to pivot this one on you. How has this mentality affected the way that you run Lucidum? It is the way you have to run a startup and it is the way to run Lucidum. So uh, maybe perhaps we talked about this earlier. Uh, so in a corporate environment, uh, there is such a thing as strategic procrastination. <laughs> this is a true statement. Every, I want everybody to listen up to this one because this is definitively true. <laughs> All right, so today's November tenth. Uh, this is the is this, is this the is this the board deck conversation the again? Board deck. Yeah, yeah, the, the board, board deck. deck. Yeah. Uh, so, so we've got we've got our board meeting, Neil, as you know, on December fifteenth. Yeah. And uh, it's going to take us about four hours, you and me, to pull together. Uh, I own IT, you own security. We got to pull together our tech deck for it. Well, we know it's twenty pages, uh, but here's the deal, pal. Um, I say we work on this on December twelfth. What, Joel? On December 12th, that's only three days. Yeah, but hear me out, Neil. So it'll take us four hours to pull this deck together and then we can turn it over to the committee, but then the committee is gonna circulate and they're gonna critique the font, the size, the boxes, the shadow, <laughs> the placement, too many words, not enough words. Those pictures, can you rotate it? And it's gonna come back to us after about 60 hours of their time. You and I are gonna take another 12, four of that complaining to get whatever changes that are gonna go back that are still gonna need changes. So here's my proposal, Neil. Let's wait until the 12th of December, spend four hours, which we'll get only one hour of feedback that there will be no time to accommodate and we'll be done. It'll cost the company five hours to get the board deck done. But if we do it today, it'll cost the company 80 hours. Now, Neil, as a steward of the company's time and your own, what's better for the company? <laughs> Strategic procrastination, right? But it feels terrible, but it is the right thing. It, it, it's, it's sad but it is true so so as a as a startup in the series a having accomplished that you know that you've got that that lion chasing you to the second you know water station how do you keep that going like how do you keep the company motivated that they're not strategically procrastinating that they have to keep running how do you not burn out your employees to keep them ahead of that lion yeah, so again, like, you, you, you can't, you can't not burn out. I, 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 don't, I don't believe so. I mean, you know, people talk about culture and there's very charismatic leaders and there's this thing, but like really people, uh, you're gonna burn out. And so for some people, it's um, compartmentalized. Mm -hmm. For some people, I wanna, I'm gonna microwave my candle. Forget about burning it at both ends, I'm <laughs> microwaving my candle. And you get 30 seconds of amazing out of me, but then then you gotta pack me in a Tupperware and put me in the fridge for four hours before I'm a candle again, right? So that's, that's fair. And if that's how you need to work, I will fit you in. And so that's, I think, the job of 
uh, somebody who's responsible for other people's priorities mm. is to help them first know them, know what you need, and then arrange people so they fit the outcomes that you're after. Because always cheering on from the sidelines or always saying good job, that's, that's cool, right? That's valuable. Encouragement is helpful. But knowing me and how I work and how I need to fit, that's even better. For people who may have taken pause to the fact that you slapped them in the head with the you can't avoid burnout and there there will be burnout and you know that may hit some people pretty hard especially folks who may be thinking about going to a startup where's the kind of the good news side of that what's the, the burnout's awesome burnout's awesome yeah bur burnout can be awesome so it doesn't have to break you um you think about so um without being facetious or without you think about olympic athletes and how many times in their life they're sick of gymnastics, sick of judo, sick of, because you reach the point where you just can't swallow anymore. I just can't take anymore. And then you take a step back and what you learn about yourself is, ooh, that was a bridge too far for me. Mm -hmm. I need to know what my, my signals are so that I stop short of that. And then the next time you do a little better and then you realize, oh, you know what? There was, a, there was another break sign there that I missed. There was a caution sign on that curve and I went whipping around that. And I mean, how is it different than trying to advance past that boss level and learning the move and you get three, four steps forward and then, oh, okay, what were the four steps I took? It's the same thing. And so burnout isn't uh, fatal. Burnout is emotional exhaustion. It's a bottoming out and it feels terrible and you don't want to do it. You don't desire that. Okay. So now next time, what did that path look like? Mm -hmm. How do I stop one step short of that? What do I need? And so exactly like that internship, you need that moment and you need to own it yourself. Uh, ask for help, absolutely, but. Work with your leadership, understand when you're at that point, recognize how far you can go, bring it all back together and take those opportunities to not get to burn out, recircle the wagons, press on move the mission forward. And if you have friends who will say to you, hey, listen, man, it's Friday morning at 10 o'clock and you look like crap. Are you okay? You look tired. And you think to yourself, no, I feel amazing. And then you think, <laughs> you know, maybe I should take a couple hours off. Or maybe I, right? It, it helps. Uh, my co-founder has done that to me. Mm. Hey, he say, don't work on Saturday. Make sure you, you don't burn out. I've been able to say it to him. And so that's like, I can take, I am responsible for myself. I'm also responsible for my partner and the members of the company. And so to go to them and say, hey, make sure you take that time off or even use your positional authority and say, okay, we're shutting down the company for a week. We, mm -hmm. we did this, we did this. Um, because as Charles, my co-founder and I talked, uh, it was pretty clear to us, people are pushing themselves so hard. Mm -hmm. uh, burnout is obvious on its way. Yeah. And so we can jump in and stop this. And so we shut it down for a week. Um, and then I could use my positional authority to say, and if I catch you on Slack, I am suspending your email account, right? <laughs> Which is kind of funny, but then it's also kind of true. And everybody's like, okay, we actually do have permission not to do stuff. And this isn't like, who's the true believers in our cult? Who's really gonna, right? Yeah, let that go. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I did hear um, I, I did hear from somebody recently that that you're somebody special so you're special someone in your life maybe starting a um, a union um, to to rally against the amount of work that you uh, y amount of hours that you put into work. <laughs> so, uh, sweetheart, if you're watching, here, uh, according to uh, the U.S. federal court system, wives cannot be compelled to testify against their husbands so uh, whatever neil's talking about baby i uh i don't know i don't know i don't know all right Killer moving me. on Killer. moving on um i wanted to do something fun oh actually no looks like i've got a question here from b -Sec. um is that board behind joel ever used uh is it just there for looks because it looks like it's a pain in the ass to get out from behind that bookcase <laughs> Yes, um, I appreciate the attempt at OSINT. So when we lived in California, the board was used. Now that we are no longer in California, the board, uh, like me, is simply a display <laughs> item. <laughs> 
when and yeah, see he he said board and i'm like i'm looking behind you like i don't see a whiteboard back there the surfboard <laughs> right. the surfboard um any other questions carmen you want to push real quick We'll see if there's all right. No other questions. All right. Um, so I did want to do something fun with you, Joel, because, um, you know, old guy being crotchety. We have these conversations all the time. You kind of poked me about this in, in pre-roll a little bit. And um, obviously we've got RSA right around the corner. I don't know if we're going to have you on the stream before RSA comes up. We just got done with Black Hat, you know, not too long ago. And one of the fun things to do in cybersecurity is to really kind of talk about uh, buzzword bingo. Um, mm. and so there was an article that came out, uh, just a couple days ago that talked about the 11 cybersecurity buzzwords that you should stop using right now. And so awesome. I want to kind of go through these 11 buzzwords that you should stop using right now. And I want to get your reaction to them. Okay. Okay. You ready for the first right. one? The first, I, I feel like I'm being set up and I am not ready. But let's <laughs> get me. All right, the first buzzword, Joel, that you should be, stop using for the rest of 2021 and into 2022 is ransomware. Why is that a buzzword? Good question. Why do you think that's a buzzword? I think it's very descriptive. I don't think it's a buzz. I don't think it's a buzzword. You I think, think that? Do you think that we overuse it in media to describe almost every cyber attack that's happened in the last 18 to 24 months? <laughs> so, uh, media are, are experts at predicting the past. That's Only right. Only they try to predict it too early. So, they don't know yet, right? You, you want to be the first out, uh, and you don't really know what's happened. So, you could call it ransomware, um, but really, you don't get your news from the media anymore. Um, so, when it's actually ransomware, that is valuable to me mm -hmm. as a security mm -hmm. leader, because now I... Uh, so uh, what would be more valuable than ransomware is getting more specific. Being more technically accurate would be more valuable to me, but then I would lose people. So. Then you'd lose people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. All right. All so right. Second, second buzzword. Second buzzword. Zero trust. Zero trust. Yeah, so why is that a buzzword? Oh, uh, see, your mic's breaking up again. Is that what's happening? Yeah. Because along with my... No, uh, no, your mic's, your, mic's, your, mic's, your mic's legitimately breaking up now. It's, it's amazing how as soon as I mentioned zero trust, your mic decides to, to take a dump. Whatever you did before, smack it upside the head. I, I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. Nope. I'm back. Nope. Nope. <laughs> nope. <laughs> it's like over like here. <laughs> okay. See, okay. Nope. 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 All right, all right. That goes that static. Static. Oh, yeah, that's bad. Oh, that's bad. Oh, that's bad. Zero trust. That's why it's a buzzword, folks. That's why it's a buzzword, because it causes all sorts of static and all sorts of echoes in this echo chamber that we've got in cybersecurity. Zero trust. I can't. Oh man, I was, I was, I was waiting for him on this one too. I was waiting for him on this one. Let's see if he's back now. Let's see if he's back. You back now? Now you're muted. Yeah. Now you're muted. No. Now you're muted. <laughs> Zero trust, folks. Zero trust. <laughs> yeah, you're really muted. You're really muted. <laughs> Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. He's going to, he's going to, he's going to leave and come back. He's going to leave and come back in. Um, while that's going on, um, let's talk about just a couple of things that are coming up before we'll get right back into buzzword bingo. I appreciate everybody being uh, uh, patient with, uh, with Joel. Um, I don't know if you saw or not, we have an amazing guest that is coming on the show on November 29th. We have Ben Spring, who is the co-founder of Try Hack Me, um, who is going to come on the stream on November 29th. Now, that stream is going to be at a different time zone or a different time schedule. It's actually going to be 7.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time because he's obviously in the U.K. We are giving away something pretty amazing during that stream he has volunteered and we haven't got the final count yet but we are going to be giving away 
annual passes to try hack me so not just these monthly things that we've been typically doing but we're going to be giving away annual passes to to try hack me as well as um as some swag so you're not going to want to miss that um november 29th 7 30 in the morning it looks like joel's back let's bring him in let's see if the robot's gone how do we sound we sound good awesome we all got right you now. i ditched the microphone i threw it out the window it and the surfboard now no longer functional. It now and now now two things are no longer functional. That's right. Kind of like zero trust. <laughs> All three of those things: the microphone, the surfboard, and zero trust no longer functional. <laughs> <laughs> so zero trust as buzzword bingo. Now it is. I make no qualms about this. That I have a personal and utter hate for zero trust. <laughs> well, uh, you can't. You can't define it. You can't define it in me, a room with one other person. Me personally, or just the industry as a whole? I, I would I would bet you, Neil, cannot define it in a room with two other people and have them agree with your definition. Oh, absolutely, 100%. I don't think, so what you, are we could, talking I don't about? think you could do no, it. of course not. Of course not. <laughs> That's no, why I say there's I, no chance. I think we have an industry problem. That's why I think that it is very adequately added to the list of buzzwords for 2021 is zero trust do you do you believe in zero trust like i think from an attack surface management <laughs> perspective at lucidum do you believe in zero trust well the fact that you asked me if it that it requires my belief <laughs> there's our problem right there <laughs> do i believe in it i don't know i've never seen yeah somebody commented <laughs> it's a mindset yeah yeah zero trust is an attitude yeah thanks for that how much is that attitude <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. It's a, it's apparently a billion dollar industry. I think I'm going to talk out of both sides of my face here. I love the idea of zero trust. I know exactly what it means, but I'm the only guy who understands what it means, right? That everybody yeah. else has their own opinion of it. So if I got my version of zero trust, it's, it's beautiful. It's a lot of work to set up, but it solves a lot of problem. It, it isolates lateral movement. It but nobody can have it because we are the blind fake ears touching the elephant. Mm -hmm. One guy's pretty sure an elephant's like a tree because he's got it by the legs. And another guy's pretty sure an elephant's like a snake because he's got it by the tail. And we're <laughs> all completely wrong. So, um, I, I, I think I, I agree mostly with what you said, right? We all have our own definitions of zero trust. Because, and the reason that I'll elaborate on that is because when you read the original theoretical paper behind Zero Trust, it's nothing mm -hmm. but that. It's a, it's a college essay that was written in a pipe dream about how we will never realistically ever architect a network to be successful. Yeah. 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 All right. The no, next well, one, go ahead. Old guy. Old guy, let's go back to the C2 series, right? The Rainbow Book series. Oh, my God. That was published by the yeah. NSA. Yeah. And make a system C2 certified. And now you've got C2 in a network. There's zero trust. So, like, break it down to its elements, and it makes a lot of sense. But, yes, this is a this is a buzzword. Um, it needs to go away. How many, how, many, how many vendors do you think we're going to see with zero trust at RSA this year? <laughs> All of them. <laughs> All, of, All them. of them. Does that include yeah. Lucidum? Does that include Lucidum? Absolutely, because we're going to say we're here to make fun of Zero Trust, and you'll be like, see, you're, you're promoting Zero Trust, girl. There's no such thing as bad. All right, the next one on the list, whitelist and blacklist, buzzword for 2021. True or false? Uh, false. You think so? Yeah, I do. Um, uh, all right, AI-powered security. <laughs> so there's three... <laughs> See, you get an easy one, you get a hard one. You get an easy one, you get a hard one. <laughs> this is like zero trust. Like nobody knows what AI is. Oh, everybody knows what AI models. is. Yeah, right, just like zero trust. And that's <laughs> So maybe, maybe Neil, that's the denominator here. If everybody says, I know what that is, and when they turn over their answer sheet like the newlywed game, we all disagree, then that's a buzzword that's got to go. <laughs> Let, let's let's define this right so we had richard mclean ceo of INE on you know beginning of the year and, and he was and, and we you know we asked him about ai in a different context and he was like oh a, a binary decision tree right or a really fast binary decision tree um obviously that's a very cynical response to the the, the term of ai but wouldn't you argue that AI is pretty much in everything that we do anyway and has been for years? I mean, the ability to make computerized decisions based on empirical data 
has been around. I mean, EDR in its, it, it, you know, if we think back carbon black, um, carbon black response when it made behavioral analytic uh, assumptions, um, you know, back in some of the days of its early EDR was AI based EDR because it was looking at behaviors on a network and making really fast binary decisions on a network. So we've had AI for a while. Siri. You know, I've got this, I've got this little rule and it's like on the inside of my shirt. And the rule says, every time you feel like starting a sentence with, well, actually, don't say that sentence. <laughs> so I'm just not going to say this sentence. Gotcha. Gotcha. It started out like that, right? <laughs> it, it did. It started out with, as a, well, actually, Neil. Uh, but we don't need to. What, what's interesting to me is um, we, societally, beginning in really the, the mid 80s, we stopped being strict about our definitions of words. And we started letting words It's post positivism, we started letting words mean things based on their context. Mm. And that really drifted. So if we say artificial intelligence, then the next question that um, somebody like me would ask is, do you mean narrow, strong, or super? because there's three classes of artificial intelligence. And if you said, this is automating decisions based on external variables, I'd say, oh no, that's a batch file. That's a script. <laughs> that's not artificial intelligence. And if you said calculating variables to infer characteristics that are not native in the data and then making decisions, that's not AI, that's machine learning. Yeah. And so, so for me, words have, a discrete importance. And so I get real sensitive when people say things like using verbs as nouns, what's your ask? Like ask is always a verb, it's not a noun. And so when people say, well, that's just AI, I get this little bit of vapor lock and then I let it go you because get people don't hang twitch. out with me when I get a little twitch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so looks like going back to zero trust, Mr. Baz uh, says, can you have zero trust without going back to the stone age? Yeah, that's, uh, I'm not, oh, not going to step in that trap. Uh -oh. <laughs> not going to do it. Uh -huh. uh, okay. uh -huh. So that's actually called uh, Schrodinger's zero trust. <laughs> yes, you can, but once you look at it, it's gone. It's gone. <laughs> Schrodinger's zero trust. You heard it here first. We're going to start a company. We're going to get some Series A behind it. Schrodinger's zero trust. <laughs> <laughs> Product's amazing. Don't look at it. That's right. Don't look at it. You can't see it, but it works. It's working. It's working. Trust All me. All right. Next, uh, next, next uh, buzzword. So AI cybersecurity. Obviously, that's a uh, we got that one nailed on the buzzword. Bingo. Um, next one, number five. Cyber nine eleven. Ooh. True or false buzzword. Um. That's that's pretty terrible. Okay. That's, 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 uh, that's a little offensive. Do you, you know where that one comes from, right? Um, I, I infer that it comes from the anticipation that our intelligence community will miss a catastrophic cyber terrorist attack in the same way that they did. In it's oftentimes referred to either in the industrial control system area, a power grid example, a water treatment. Yeah, phase, SCADA yeah. systems. Yep. Yeah. 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 So, so do you think that that's another one of those cases where media has created a term specifically for that um, kind of cyber fear mongering? Yeah, because because look what it look what it does. It took you telling me. Yeah. Hey, focus the conversation on. Do you know where it came from? It's not really, but like cyber nine eleven. Like, what are we after now? Yeah, you, that it does not motivate people using that label does not motivate people to say to the intelligence community, y'all should stop having silos and you should share information and the politicking should be minimized for the good of the. That's not what the focus is. So that is not only a neutrally distasteful buzzword, but I believe that is an actively harmful buzzword. Nice. All right, we'll move on from that one then. Digital transformation. We hear this one all the time in every organization. We, we've heard it from CIOs for years. Digital transformation. So if zero trust was a buzzword, this must be the opposite of a buzzword because I know what zero trust means, but nobody knows what digital <laughs> transformation means. What? what is digital transformation? Oh, yeah. come on. I mean, it's it's the ability for all of our stuff to be organically uh, originated in the cloud and be accessible by the World Wide Web and all that stuff. 
Joel? You know, that's a fair point. We are moving to locally sourced organic data storage here. Oh my, holy cow. I can't <laughs> believe that just came out. You're, Somebody clip right? that one. Somebody clip that one. That <laughs> one's turning into a meme. That one is a meme right there. <laughs> All right, moving on to this. So this one, I'd be interested in this. So this, this again, showed up on a legitimate chart for buzzword bingo. Mm. Number seven, SIM. That's interesting. Coming, coming from I, Splunk, I, I figured this is appropriate with you coming from Splunk. SIM in 2021 is considered buzzword that you should stop using. Uh, well... I mean, ironically, many people have stopped using their sims, but that's different than not using the word. Well, that's because they're using so, they're using um, um, XDR. Oh, oh, you know, if you can get a CEH to install your XDR, you almost got zero trust. Oh, oh, with the trifactor, right? With the trifactor, <laughs> I, I this one I disagree with. This one I disagree yeah. with. I, I think um, I, I don't think this one's a buzzword. I think this one just suffers of lack of education. What is this next one? Uh, sim. I was still on the sim one. I had oh, moved sim? on. Oh, yeah. sim? Oh, sim. Yeah, I, I, I don't know why that's a buzzword. Um, it's a, it's like saying firewalls are a buzzword. Yeah. It's a descriptive functional title for a piece of technology that fits in a workflow. Yeah. And, and, yeah, it, and it, should be, it, should be pretty, it should be pretty fundamental to almost every security operations team in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, it does. It does prompt me to wonder whether the word buzzword is overused and becoming itself a buzzword. That's a good point. Moving on to number eight. Yeah. This one's more of a right. buzz buzz phrase than anything else. People are the weakest link. You are the weakest oh, link. That's so Goodbye. nasty. That is so Why nasty. Why is that nasty? You know, I don't have any uh, technology answers. I work in a product company. I'm mm -hmm. very proud of the work that's been done. And uh, our product is honestly pretty amazing. But our product is not a solution. No products are solutions. People solve problems. Products are tools that they use or don't use correctly or, or incorrectly. And so to go around and saying that people are the weakest link is to say that if it wasn't for these people, this network would be amazing. <laughs> Do you, but yeah. so, so the counterpoint to that though, right, is that the only secure network is one without users. Ah, not if you define security as confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Oh, oh, I like no where you're going with this. Yeah, the network, so the network get, can be available without people. Uh, no, no availability measures would be fulfilled. Like, why does it exist? Now it's the solipsistic, omphaloskeptic, self-contained being. Mm. Those, by the way, are my passwords. So, uh, <laughs> confidential, integrity, and availability, or or the other one. <laughs> uh, the own Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. So, if you look at the Robin Hood breach uh, that happened, and again, it's too early to talk. Yeah, there's a strong team there. They know what they're doing. The way that that attacker got in was not through their compliance mandated, regulatory scrutinized, strong technology and team built. The way that they got in, it seems from early reports based on the company, is social engineering mm -hmm. through the call center. So does that mean people are the weakest link? It really doesn't. It means people are a link in that chain. What would have stopped that? Well, that person being the strongest link. How many times did that attacker attempt to social engineer? Maybe a thousand. Maybe that person hit 999 stronger links. And so we're gonna call out the one thing that got through and say all people, weakest link. I think that it's not only a buzzword, but it's actively setting as an adversary the people who should be desiring you're there and partnering with you. What What is a better way to describe, because I think the counterpoint to that that most people would argue, right, is the ones that you brought up, right? Social engineering, it only takes one person to click on a link, it only takes one person's password, it only takes one person to gain access to a Slack channel that they don't need to have access to, right? Um, how else would you define that if you wouldn't define that as the weakest link? Yeah. Um, I'd be cool with the with the use of the term weakest link if we understood the the expression weakest is not binary. Mm. It's it's right because it's the third tier, right? Weak, weaker, weakest. It's the third tier. So if you fixed people, what then becomes your weakest link? Because you will have one, no matter what. You will have a weakest link. 
So what would that next weakest link be? So the question isn't, are people your weakest link? The question is, how come people are still your weakest link? Ooh, ooh, I think that that brings us to the next, the number nine buzzword on the list, which is security awareness. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm a big fan of all kinds of awareness. Um, that sounded, like, that sounded last... like a legal statement when you say that. When you say it like that, that was kind of like, I, I'm, I'm obliged to say I'm a big fan of security awareness. I'm, I'm a big fan because I think it's, it's stunning to me that uh, for the month of October, the NFL will dress up in pink so that people can be aware of breast cancer. W what are you actually doing about breast cancer? Oh, we're making you aware of it. Well, that's cute. What does that do? What does that accomplish? Like awareness is, and this goes right into security awareness. There's no, there's very little value in it that's positive, and there's a lot of negative value in it. Most security awareness, I think that you show how much you respect your team, your fellow employees, the people you support. You show how much you respect them by the kind of training you give them. Most of us tell our users we don't respect them very much. <laughs> we give them training out of the seventies. <laughs> that's meme worthy people are screenshotting it and sharing it around and then we what do we do then we hit them on the head and we say neil uh i looked at the report and three people on your team they haven't done the annual awareness training yeah. and we need to go ahead and get that checked off because you know it's being reported in the roll-up and that's going to show up on your okrs yeah and so you go and you bash the three people on the head you say you got to go watch the stupid training and they say well uh, i'm just going to let it play and i'm going to go out and have a vape break you're like cool it's what i did and so that's security <laughs> awareness training <laughs> Because people don't need to be aware of security. I've never met somebody who, when we did security awareness training, said, oh, is that what's going on? <laughs> right? Not once. <laughs> what they always say is, oh, I didn't realize I mattered. I didn't realize me doing that was causing a problem. When I click that phishing link, you're telling me, like, you don't have it contained, Fulton? I thought, like... Like I could just do stuff and you got my back. I didn't realize you weren't that good at your job, Joel. So I'll stop <laughs> looking on links. Like that's that's a difference. So now they're motivated. Now they know exactly what's happening. So that's my two cents on it. So 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 security aware cybersecurity awareness training, true statement on the buzzword on, on the buzzword bingo. Buzzword. buzzword on that one. All right. Yep. With now, a side of get off my lawn. Now now here's the here's the other the only counterpoint that I have to the the security awareness conversation, right? Is um I think I'm a little bit more vitriol in the fact that that we need to stop doing it the way that we've been doing it in the past, but we don't care enough about it to change it in the future because we only have to hit that checkbox that says, yes, we're doing it. We yeah. don't have to do anything else. We just have to hit that checkbox that says, yes, we've given that training to our users. Terrible. Terrible. Yeah. All right. Number 10. Number 10. Cyber kill chain. How many are these? There's gonna be eleven of these. <laughs> this is number ten. This is number ten. All right, cyber kill chain. Well, I don't know. Yes, it's this an one, overused. Buzzword. This one. Absolutely. This one is overused, but I think it's mis It's the most misunderstood on this entire list. It's the one that I would say is the most misunderstood. I, th um, I think digital transformation is the most misunderstood, but I get your point. <laughs> That's a fair point. I was thinking by sensible people. You were thinking by the masses. My uh, bad. My I was thinking by executives. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'll yeah. yeah. Potato, yeah. potato. Right. Um, um, because I mean, like, I think cyber kill chain has a place. Like, I think we've gotten so hung up with MITRE that we do forget that cyber kill chain is another model that actually does work really, really well. Um, I just don't think it's taught. I don't think people explain it. I don't think people talk about it in a way there's not a cool, fancy, you know, simulator and, um, you know, calculator that you can use. We don't have an entire website that's dedicated to all the TTPs that are associated to MITRE attack tactics we don't have a kill chain you know attack tactics chart that we can reference and so i think it kind of gets brushed under the rug as the less sophisticated um you know methodology discussion versus something like miter i i concur yeah. it's valuable in terms of the causal effect the links in the chain right understanding that yeah. not buzzword but getting down into dynamics uh super helpful last one Last one, 
and this is this is intentionally triggering no. most overused buzzword that we should put to rest in 2021 on this list by CSO online hacker <laughs> uh, what not CSO <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, I get how they could make that decision. All right, fine. Uh, I, I don't think so at all. You don't think I, so at all? I, uh, no, 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 no. So my uh, my 11-year-old son wants to be a hacker. So when he was much younger than this, I took him in to Splunk and introduced him to uh, one of my red team members because it was bring your kid to work day, also known as let your boss impose on you as a babysitter day. So I brought my son in. <laughs> And uh, I introduced him to my friend who was part of the red team. And I said to this friend of mine who worked on the team, I said, this is my son, Sam. And, and Sam, would you tell him what you'd like to do? And he goes, I want to be a hacker. And this guy goes, do you even know what that means? And he goes, I want to learn how to get through firewalls. <laughs> so <laughs> off they went, right? So, and, and that was uh, awesome because Sam thinks about a hacker as somebody who finds a way. Yeah. And so to him, that means, can I take this apart and rebuild it? Can I understand how this works? Can I solve these problems? Can I think in a way that I am not led to think to get the answer? And so I, I have no problem with him saying, I want to be a hacker because I think that the hacker is the person that will disassemble the Volkswagen Beetle, take it piece by piece into your house and reassemble it in your living room. That's a hacker. Yeah. And that's exactly what I want my son to be if that's what he's after. So. And, and, and so I, I I'm glad for that because because I, I I do also disagree with that right I don't I don't think hacker is an overused buzzword I think that people may be tired of hearing it and I think that pe people may be tired of hearing how ubiquitously we use it but I think that that's because we've stopped talking about that definition of a hacker right we stopped talking about it from that educational sense from that curiosity sense from that critical yeah. thinking sense and we've we've too much tied it to cyber criminal activity that we've we've we don't use it in the sense that actually makes it a productive job description behavioral trait however you want to call it absolutely absolutely i concur so there you go folks um thank you very much joel for playing our game 11 buzzwords for 2021 that we need to lay to rest um i got one more thing that i want to get your opinion on and then i'm going to open it up to questions because we've got you and i know people love to have you we're going to do a longer q a segment than we usually do um i want to talk about something pretty awesome and i say it's pretty awesome just because um obviously we mentioned ransomware on as being number one on that buzzword bingo list um you know we we think that it's it's kind of overused but in all fairness it is one of the biggest problems that we do have in cybersecurity currently um attacks are up you know you know ransoms you know, ransom payments have obviously gone up we see doj coming through with new ofac sanctions things like that there's lots of churn around this conversation of ransomware now we come to find out that there's been an arrest by the Department of Justice um, in cooperation with a lot of different companies, Ukraine, Romania, um, other organizations of some of the re evil um, um, affiliate folks to the tune of six million dollars were seized. There's been a ten million dollar reward that's been put on the leadership at, um, you know, you know, organizations like Dark Side. So I say all this to say. Um, are do you think that this is just a knee-jerk reaction by doj based on how much publicity ransomware has gotten over the last 18 months or do you think that this is a sign that doj may have finally hit a wake-up call that says okay maybe we actually need to do something about this wow that is a really hard question mm -hmm. that's, that's the only that's kind really you get from us yeah, no, the, the buzzword thing was uh, more hard on other people. This is hard. <laughs> um, because it, it, you obviously, like, th there's other options in what you set up. But those two options are really interesting. Because why has there been such a delay? And then we know the pattern of practice is overcharging. The only reason you get a 99% conviction record is if I charge you with 43 crimes instead of the one that I ought to have so that you plead and that I maintain my conviction record. So you've got on one side, you know the game that they're playing, and then you know the obvious political uh, influences that mm -hmm. are endemic, right? And again, seeing the game for, for what it is, um, 
doesn't make a game scary, but you see the dynamics. And then there is the fact that we have ransomware that is actually now hurting people physically. Um, so there should be pressure on this. So I can't, I can't have, I can't answer your question. I have no wisdom or insight into that. That is a good question to ask. And then I think the way you would answer that is to see what happens next. What happens over the next several months? Is there a prosecutor or an investigator that sticks with this and that begins to exploit? Because is this the end or are they turning those folks? And are they looking to roll up a network? That's what I would look for to answer your question. Do you think that there is a correlation between um, us working from home, all the COVID stuff that we've seen going on, and the rise of ransomware? I gave a talk. Um, I, I was I was a moderator for a panel for VMware Carbon Black a couple months ago where we talked about the rise of mm -hmm. ransomware. We talked about you know some of the factors that were you know kind of that we had seen in other places, specifically in FS, specifically in healthcare. To your point, we've seen people start to actually get injured because of ransomware. From your perspective, do you think that we are gonna continue to see a rise of ransomware? Or do you think that now that we're coming on the other side of COVID, so to speak, potentially we'll start to see maybe a decline in ransomware? No, I don't think we'll see a decline at all. <clears throat> um, it's been a mess. Um, COVID, triggers, quarantine, triggers, work from home, IT is completely unprepared for it. You think we've, the, flood, the floodgates are open, it's it's game on now? A hundred percent. Yeah. Awesome. Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah, the, uh, Gartner released a report that uh, of ransomware uptick in the centralized data storage repositories. That ransomware is now being aimed at yeah. NAS, cloud storage, et cetera. So, um, and they're Ooh. not done. So you, I, I you, do you think, think you think we're going to get you think we're going to see a case of ransomware in the cloud? I do. Is that your prediction for 2022? Are we going to come back in 12 months and have you on the stream? And in 2022, we're going to see a case of ransomware in the cloud. I think we'll see a significant case of cloud storage ransomware. You heard it here fo first, folks. We will record this and we will come back in 12 months. We will see if we can hear a case of cloud storage ransomware. Uh, Joel, that is it for my prepared material. I'm going to ask Carmen to start pushing some of the questions that she's been gathering, um, you know, over the sure. course, um, you know, of the stream. Um, I appreciate you dealing with my game on um, on the, the 11 buzzwords. I do truly appreciate that. That was uh, fantastic. Yeah, uh, one of my interns sent that one to me, and I was like, oh, I'm definitely doing that with Joel. We'll, we'll get on some good high horses for that one. <laughs> Love uh, it. Chris says, um, read the founder's dilemma. How does a security tech company go about raising funding from raising funding and managing risk that comes with it from? And there seems to be a lot more after that. Um, have you read that book? Are you familiar with that book at all? Yeah. Yeah, that is uh, a fantastic book. Oh, I just got the I got the rest of the questions sent to me. Sorry. How does a security tech company go from raising funding and managing the risk that comes with it from a CEO standpoint? That's the second half of that question on after the founder's dilemma. Yeah, yeah. So um, if you've read the, uh, I'm not sure if this is present tense or exhortive. The verb that starts this, but yeah, let me assume Chris has said that he's read this and this yeah. having read this, this prompts the question. If that's the case, um, first, well done. That is the right book to read if you have any interest in starting a company and if whether venture backed or not. And if you think you do and you read it, you may learn that you don't or you shouldn't have that interest. It, the book is that truthful. Hmm. The, the book is really um, a less caffeinated, less sexy version of, well, Neil, what you do. So what is it that I as do? As you go through this. <laughs> Well, whatever it is, it's more sexy and more caffeinated. Oh, okay, gotcha. So the founder's dilemma is very truth-telling. It gets right down to the nuts and bolts of what exactly are you after? What does it take? What does it look like? What do you need? And many folks have read that book thinking, this is going to teach me to start a company, and walked away thinking, ooh, this has taught me I shouldn't start a company. So it's a terrific book. So how do you deal with the risk that comes from uh, fundraising? Um, to the easiest way to answer this is those risks are largely, largely knowable before you raise the money. 
you need to decide in advance, am I raising? How much am I raising from whom? What kind of firm am I raising from? Or is it angels? Do I bring in a partner? How do we split equity? All of those traps you should uncover, disarm, and understand before you decide to raise money. Mm. Because there will be new traps that you couldn't predict once you are raising and have raised money. And so pre-going out, make sure you understand those traps. Second, there's an aphorism that's absolutely true, and that is when you are raising money, if you ask for advice, they think you're asking for money. If you ask for money, they'll give you advice. So not understand the game that is being played. I don't mean game in a dismissive way. I mean game in terms of a system that has its own internal rules that the people who participate understand that people on the outside don't. That's what you get into when you start to raise money. So when you do that, when it's time, reach out to folks, to CEOs of startups and ask them, can I have 10 minutes of your time? I'm looking to raise money. I guarantee you, you'll I, get a 50% callback rate. I was going to ask you, how many, like, when you think about that, how many folks did you reach out to with Lucidum? So I spoke, I spent about three years meeting with startup founders before starting Lucidum. And, a lot and of people. A lot of people. Hundreds, hundreds of people. Easy, hundreds of people. Asking them everything from... So how much do you pay yourself? Mm -hmm. to, what about healthcare? And how do you know we need a salesperson? How do you know your product is any good? How do you like sell somebody your soft? Like all those questions, absolutely. Where do you buy your office furniture? <laughs> like do you expense your cell phone? Like all those questions, because you think to yourself, you're the only moron that doesn't intuitively know the answers, but you're not. So all those questions, people are glad to answer them. How about, to your point about like, how many CEOs did you talk to that said, how do I raise money? How many of those CEOs did you talk to when you were going through that process? 50. Yeah. Maybe more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I got wonderful advice. I, I would imagine so. It was, it was obviously very successful for you. Um, what was the worst advice you got? Um, the worst advice is always uh, somebody who's never done it before, right? That The source of that advice. Um, can be those. Uh, worst advice I received, uh, well, the worst advice comes at the end of a pitch to a VC firm when they tell you how you should have built your pitch deck. And one of two things is happening. Either they're positioning in terms of power to make sure that you feel intimidated by them, or <laughs> they're pushing you to see how strongly you believe you're right. And so in the beginning, because I had just transitioned from asking people, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? I was like super open. And so they said, you know, we feel a lot better if you led with the product and went with the team and then went with the total addressable market. I thought, oh, okay, well, let me rearrange those slides. And then I go to VC2 and they're like, you know what? I don't understand why you led with the product. You should really lead with the team. I was mm -hmm. like, oh, these guys are making me crazy. You guys don't know what you're talking about. Like those three thoughts came, bang, bang. One, and then I thought, okay. So I'm gonna decide what I want. And so I sat down with Charles, my co-founder, and we decided what we wanted and we went in and delivered it. And they said, you know, we really feel like you should put like team last. I'm like, I know where you're going with this. Wow. And we thought about that. But the reason I did it this way is because I wanted you to understand the team matters or the product might change. The product might change, but the market's not gonna change. So mm -hmm. we went team, market, product. That's why I'm doing this. And they're like, okay, they said, we get it. And all of that chasing my tail went away. Wow. So that was the worst mm -hmm. advice, which became helpful. Well, there you go. Um, California says, um, has a question, says, along with asset discovery, how important is API discovery and management? How do you see the industry moving towards better API discovery and management along with asset discovery? Yeah, um, I think we spoke uh, California after the last stream. Yes, that's our, that's our buddy in, super... so in South, uh, South Korea, almost in South Carolina. <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. Good to talk to you again. Thanks for joining. Uh, it's incredibly important and it's super difficult because APIs don't leave traces. Uh -huh. So um, registering them, identifying um, systems, drawing, connecting to them to extract is really the only way you can infer their existence. Otherwise, they can sit out there like a landmine waiting to be exploited. Um, very important, very difficult. Are APIs the new assets? No. Ooh, okay. Didn't expect that one. Are you saying that because you're afraid that it will ruin your business model? Yes. 
And that, my friends, is why it's Cyber Truth Bombs. <laughs> so uh, the problem with elevating APIs, well, I guess look, I should define my terms. Um, an asset to us, to me, is anything that stores, transmits, or processes data. Okay. And so the asset as a class is a superset that does include the API. So the sub can't be more important than the and then the asset. So that's that's why I answered it the way that I did. Um, but the difficulty with APIs is almost nobody understands them. Mm -hmm. like, like you, you got to understand when we go to deploy, um, we are an API ingestion platform. Right. And we'll meet people that are like, oh yeah, I get that. Okay, cool. Can you uh, let's talk through the read only API keys for your carbon black, and then you can watch them go. That's gonna be Bob. I'll let you. <laughs> I'm gonna pass it to Bob. And Bob's like, what APIs? No. Uh, you want. You want Julie. Yeah, you want Julie. And and like the, the hot potato is so everybody knows what an API is, but very few people deal with and, and it makes it makes a lot of sense, right? When when it's winter in Chicago and you gotta go turn off your water shut off to the outside valves so your your pipes don't explode, you think to yourself, now where did I put that that tool? Because you yeah. use it once a yeah. season, right? APIs, same, same. You use them so infrequently that you lose familiarity and therefore agility with them. I I said it, and then as I'm listening to you, I didn't have a stance before, but I would almost say the answer to that is APIs are the new asset, right? Because based on your definition of store processing, transmitting data, APIs do that. And I don't necessarily agree that they do it as a subset of the technology that supports them. I think that they are becoming so prevalent in containerized uh, instances in the way that we're doing, you know, um, you know, workloads in AWS and things like that, that you could almost look at as an, at an API as its own asset. Certainly, you could certainly look at it as its own asset until it is the only way to access data. Mm. It's the, the larger set is has been our focus, but yeah. Makes sense. Uh, Gabriel Silva comes through and says, how long till we see private sector regulations for SMBs nice. on cybersecurity controls? Example, CPA firms, staffing agencies, et cetera. I'm, uh, Gabriel, flattered that you think that I know the answer to that question. <laughs> I will uh, I'll give you my opinion because I've got a bunch of opinions here. Neil shipped me some of his and um, a lot of them don't fit. So I was going to go ahead and give them away. Uh, did, did you hear that, folks? We're giving away another internship tonight. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's one of the opinions. Actually, that's one of the opinions Neil gave me. So <laughs> at, uh, at what point, Mr. Bridges, did that stream completely go off the rails on you? You know, I think it was about the time when uh, Joel should have been drinking, but wasn't. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe at least then you'd have an excuse for you know making inappropriate decisions on stream. I don't know. Who knows? I mean, who knows? <laughs> so, uh, Gabriel, I think it will never happen in my lifetime. I think that the lobby uh, uh, supporting small businesses is really powerful, and to target them as a group with they would they would argue disproportionate regulations is going to create such pushback. I think that it's going to be, it's going to have to be triple down. You got these piecemeal things like CCPA and 201 CMR 17 in Massachusetts, where we deal with not who the entity is, but the kind of data they store, transmit or process. That is the way you'll get pressure on private sectors rather than as uh, an entity by vertical, in, in my opinion. So I, I would, I would have a tendency to agree. I don't think I, and maybe, and I've gotten more bearish on this over the years, Joel. I don't know how you have felt, but you mentioned CCPA. You mentioned the Massachusetts one. I go back to the, um, you know, I go back to GDPR, right? And and I became so cynical. God, I couldn't think of a better word for it other than cynical. When when you know, Marriott found a loophole that allowed them to escape their fine. British Airways found a loophole that got them to escape their fine. I don't necessarily think that there will ever be a regulatory agency or regulatory requirement that will have the effect that I think most of us cybersecurity folks want to see imposed yeah. upon companies. Yeah, I, um, 
I don't see any way around that. Mm. Um, and, and so uh, I was in financial institution security for a while, and you would get the OCC, the Office of the Comptroller mm -hmm. and the Currency, who would come and do your every 18 month or 12 month review, depending on your risk. And they would have codified, so written into statute, what they were there to assess, and they would have to interpret it. And part of that interpretation led to ludicrous conversations, like me being asked by two examiners for the due diligence process I went through and documented before electing to use SSH mm -hmm. on a Linux system. <laughs> like, and, and and so when you when you I want, how on. do you say say yeah. that one say that one again super super slow because I I think I want people to hear just how ridiculous that sounds when you say it. So two examiners in a conference room asked me to describe and show evidence of the process through which I conducted due diligence before selecting SSH for secure shell access to Linux servers. And, and, and I'm sure that that conversation just continued to get more asinine after that as well. Well, um, yeah, because at that point in the conversation, my attitude showed up and he brought some buddy. <laughs> And now it's like a party and that got weird. Uh, so I had to get them out of the room and then we were able to, uh, and I thought, how do I, how do I do this? How do I? So I, I said, the laptop that you've got there, are you running uh, Explorer? Here's a Windows laptop. Can you bring up File Explorer? Yep, she does. Can you tell me about the due diligence process the OCC went through to document their selection of file manager to run in Windows? And she's like, Oh, I get it. I get it. And it clicked. But they'd been doing this for every customer. Wow. And so now you and I, Neil, we are going to democratize the imposition of specific security requirements for the United States. Forget the size of the business. We're going to nail this. And we're going to put our ideas on this chat stream and we're going to come up with exactly what it ought to be. The moment we're done with the most perfect set of rules, there's a yeah, but. And there's a yeah, but over here mm -hmm. and there's a yeah, but over there mm -hmm. and this interpretation, then all of a sudden we've handed out watered down Kool-Aid and it's a mess again. So that's why I think um, as much as I hate the idea of on the software package, it says you agree to the contents of the license contained inside before you open the package. As much as I hate that and think tort reform is necessary, I think lawsuits are the way to get skin in the game for people that are not diligent with the cybersecurity of your information. Yep. Yep. Hard. And that's not, that's not cynical folks. That's just years and years and years of having gone through audits and, you know, maturity assessments and OCC this and, you know, you know, FDIC this and blah, 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 blah. It's just, there's no teeth to it anymore. There's no teeth. That's right. I concur. Devnulls in says, uh, do you think that the cloud ransomware attack will come from misconfigured containers or straight cloud vendor misconfiguration? Ooh, I love that. I De love that. De Devnulls in is one of our aspiring cloud cybersecurity folks that, that we've got in the community. He's done a really good job of really trying to become, um, very, very versed in cloud. So this is, um, this is Sweet. a very, very, um, well thought out question from Dev. And, um, he's also one of, um, I, he's one of my mentees um and and he's spent a lot of time with me trying to help hone his career and so i'm super proud of dev and just like this question i'm super proud of this question because it's insanely thought out from dev yeah in fact it's it's so thought out it follows your pattern to try to force me into one of two choices and i don't want either one of these right, you can, well you done can you can tell well he's, done, he's listening to me <laughs> yeah i like it i like it keep uh managing up that's excellent um, I, I would posit a third, um, and if I get I get bonus points because the more specific, the harder it is to hit. I think it will come from an issue as part of the software supply chain that a vendor uses to create their cloud offering that mm. results in that misconfiguration. So you think that we're, would just be gonna, my we're just going to see an extension of MyDocs or whatever happened with uh, with WannaCry? We're going to see that instance instead of it happening on prem. We're going to see that in the cloud. I think people are compiling open source software to accelerate product to feature go to market time without rigorously examining the dependencies and the vulnerabilities upstream. And they're going to package this stuff together and hand you a compiled product and you're not going to be 
Yeah. So, so that's that's interesting that you mentioned the the open source part of that. I would almost venture to say that as a startup, aren't you compelled and incentivized to use more open source software because it's cheaper, it's faster, all the benefits that come with that? If that's true, how do you stop from becoming a victim of this next cloud ransomware based on that scenario? Awesome. Okay, so let me tell you a little story that may or may not be reasonably close to the truth about a company that may rhyme with funk. <laughs> and oh, I'm just going to stretch over my head right here. There you go. There it is. <laughs> so suppose um, after, with your great love of 70s music and my experience with disco, we started a data aggregation company called Funk. And we've got a marketplace on this marketplace. People put their applications and you and I are like, Oh, that seems amazing. Yeah. Well, let's, we should probably, because they're using our name, we should probably have some kind of eval process for these applications that are in our funk marketplace. So you and I, we hire some AppSec folks and they're doing security reviews of the marketplace of funk marketplace apps to ensure that we're not, you know, promoting uh, applications that could be evil <laughs> Android. So as we do this, <laughs> We also are pushing these developers to keep your products up to date. Hey, there's yeah. bugs. You need to be responsive to our user base because Funk customers are uh, elite. They know what they're doing and you can't give them a terrible app. So when there's changes of bugs, uh, security vulnerabilities, I need it updated. Um, yeah, I know the, the chair. You know, you think you raise an A, you get a chair that doesn't collapse on you. <laughs> but what are you're you going to do? You're not Product supposed to be first. reading chat. Focus, focus. Don't read chat. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, so, so what, what do these, what do these folks do that are populating our marketplace with these apps instead of linking to the repository, they link to the repository feed and somebody edits that URL. Mm -hmm. And now we're pulling code from sources that aren't vetted through a vetted cover. Mm -hmm. So yes, you need to evaluate vet that code that you're compiling and putting in. But when you think about efficiency and speed and people linking to dynamically changing repositories that can themselves be edited, that's I think where the real issues in the supply chain are coming in. It's not that we're making, we're, we're failing to make sure we're buying good lumber. It's mm -hmm. that we signed a long-term contract. And now they stopped shipping lumber mm -hmm. and we didn't notice. <sighs> uh, I, I, when you, when you think about that, like I, I, I cringe to think that we are just now scratching the surface on all things cloud, right? The last 18 months have really accelerated everybody's use of cloud. We have not kept up with the security ramifications of everything cloud whatsoever. And so like to think about an attack scenario like that literally makes me shudder. Literally makes me absolutely, a absolutely. So, just a, a, a tiny bit of uh, blowing our our horn. When we started Lucid, I incorrectly thought our customer base are going to be largely hybrid. There's a lot of mess on prem, and people are looking to get up out of on prem and get into the cloud. And they've been transitioning to cloud for the last seven years, right? And they're not sure what they got in the data. Right? It's a big mess. Well, it turns out cloud's worse. More than half of our customers are cloud native, cloud only mm. customers. And the, the issue with the exposure, one thing that we built the software to do is, yes, discover the assets. But when we discover them, we color them with, here's the kind of data it stores, transmits, and processes by topic, by confidentiality, by classification, by who's using it, so that that issue, I cannot protect my cloud. So that means the moment that cloud has a weakness, I got to see it and jump in front of it and interdict it. Shutting that window has been our focus because it is scary. People are moving faster. They're running downhill and their body is overgaining their ability of their legs to keep up. And we're going to see some spills. Mm. Mm. Um, Timothy Moffat comes through. Um, let this, this will be a good one. I, this is somebody who definitely has, has interpreted everything you've said here and, and really it puts your technical prowess mm -hmm. up on a, on a little bit of a pedestal here, Joel. So we'll push up, put up pressure on you for this one from Timothy. That makes sense for things like an AWS, EBS, and EFS, but do you think it's possible to happen with version file-based storage like S3? Talking back to the ransomware, um, uh, cloud ransomware scenarios. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, 
in the milieu of the attack, what are we really after? In terms of uh, versioned, it is less important for me to ransom it than for me to steal it and ransom what I've stolen. Right, so so the, the concept of ransom is obviously right now, hey, I'm gonna go encrypt your data where it's at and you, can, you can't touch it, yeah, yeah, now pay me a Bitcoin. Um, but in terms of versioning, it's, it's predictable, right? So the attacker is going to know that you've got versioning in mm -hmm. those systems. And if you notice that you, then you simply roll back. And so the issue then is not just your availability that's being compromised, now it's the extortion. I'm ransoming it in a classical sense. Not that it's not available to you in situ, but that I'm going to extort it by exposing it to the world. So there's, there's pivots on this, but yes, Timothy, I think that uh, version file, depending on how you set those up, does make the direct encrypt what's in your S3 bucket and make it unusable to you very difficult. But let's also, to your point, let's make note that most TTPs of most ransomware attackers have gone towards a encrypt and ransom encrypt steal and ransom of your data um which would to your point make the versioning at least you know they would still be able to get the ransom part of that that steal and that ransom part of that be successful yeah or, or jump in the middle of your access and mm -hmm. uh ransom your route 53 ransom your ability to get access to your known good s3 markets um, so yeah it's a good question though timothy i think you're thinking about it in the right way ironically you're thinking about it in terms of the kill chain um, and I think that's valuable. I think that is value. Absolutely. Good point on that one. Nick Barker comes through, says, when using open source software, do you feel that you're creating technical debt down the road as opposed to developing what you need? Um, and I think that there's some more to that one. Um, I probably should have looked that one up before. Um, but uh, address the um, address the technical debt part of it. You're always creating technical debt. So, and that's not an excuse to carry on with your airborne mission. Um, but you gotta know you're always creating technical debt. You gotta know where that technical debt is, how much it matters to you, and have a plan to address in the order that it matters to you. I don't think it changes much because if you're developing what you need and you're building this beautiful cathedral, it's fragile and it'll take you a long time and only you can support it. If you're gonna whip something together, obviously I'm referencing Stallman here, but if you're gonna whip something together using in the market open source software and quickly cobble together a functional thing, anybody can support it, but wow, have you got some documentation and some vulnerability and mm -hmm. some workflow analysis to figure out. And so Nick, it is a choice where people, in my opinion, make a mistake is they refuse to agree it's a choice and therefore don't acknowledge they've accepted the consequences. That's, to me, that's the issue. But if you upfront know I'm making this choice and therefore my technical debt is going to be documentation and scalability or my technical debt is going to be integration and vulnerability, uh, you make that choice, you pay those prices and you're in a better position. And, and just for, for folks in chat who may not have ever heard the term technical debt before, can mm -hmm. you, especially from an, an asset management perspective, can you talk about what technical debt is and, and kind of how that happens and what the impact is to an organization? Yeah, one time I, uh, I rented a house and it was, a, it was beautiful. It was, it was this brick house in this quiet little green neighborhood and it was like, you know, like $1,200 a month and it was relatively expensive for where my budget was at. Super excited. And go into the house, there's hardwood floors, it's two stories, everything looks amazing, kind of a light kitchen, it's all great. Go downstairs and I have to stop about halfway down the stairs into the basement because the basement is full about six feet from uh, the floor up, so it's probably 18 inches from the ceiling, it's full of cardboard boxes and a wadded up newspaper. The whole basement is full. And I thought, is this an arson trap? What's happening right now? Like, do we need to, and the guy was uh, apparently had a uh, purchase and acquisition disorder. Uh, and this was, this was pre Amazon uh, Prime. And yeah. so, I went through and we started breaking down the boxes and pulling out. And in these boxes, there were pieces of art. There were portraits, small ones, large ones. There were carvings, there were statuettes. And the guy was an art collector who sometimes when he received his packages, just chucked them down the stairs. He's gonna open it later. <laughs> it was amazing, but it was also a lot of work and really gross. That is technical debt. You take over somebody's software and you find these beautiful things that are 
require a whole lot of work to undo, redo, spaghetti code. You've probably heard that expression. Mm -hmm. Making it elegant, it's no different than going into the wiring closet and looking at the Rastafarian hair nest that is the unlabeled Cat 5 and knowing you want it braided and beautiful and labeled. Getting it there. Same thing in code. Same thing in tech. And, and to bring that back together, right? What, what you're saying is like technical debt is unavoidable, right? Every company Absolutely. at some point in time will acquire technical debt, whether you're buying the hardware, buying the software, whatever, or using open source software, patching it together in house, whatever the case is, you're going to have technical debt. What the important part is, is how you handle your process for reconciling that technical debt over the life of your company. Concur. Concur. Technical debt is probably the number one problem. I would I would say that leads to asset inventory issues inside of most companies. Yeah, and next vulnerabilities to, from to, hidden software. Next to shadow IT. Next to shadow IT. Yeah. Yeah. Uh I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look for this one. Um, there we go. When trying to practice due diligence in securing supply chain, what is good enough or how would you go about it? Most of the time they have the same broad document. Yeah, okay. So um, due diligence is, Neil, you talked about training uh, and you described an aspect of training that you despise as the checkbox. Yeah. That's literally what due diligence means. It is enough diligence that's due, right? The checkbox on it. So uh, being, being pedantic, I shouldn't have used that expression, due diligence, because what I really mean is diligence. So what the diligence is that you're after here, Gabriel, is, now this is my opinion, it depends on the risk of that system. And I don't mean that to dismiss this at all, but if it's a highly risky or it's a peripheral system or it's alternate uses of the system, or if you think about things that would be a low risk system, uh, HVAC but it's connected. So that is no longer a low risk system. So take the risk of the system, the risk of its components, the kind of data that go through that, who has access to it and what they can do with the data. Is this gonna be a piece of ELT or ETL? All of this gives me a picture about how much do I care mm -hmm. about this? Once I know how much I care about this piece of software, then I do that same how much do I care about the components that comprise that software. So uh, I know Lucidum really well. Lucidum is in a single instance, multiple containers. One of those containers is data store. One of those containers runs our machine learning engine. One of those containers runs our ingestion. One runs the web server that displays our user interface. One runs the indexing server. Of those, which ones do I care the most about performing due diligence? Well, one of those is display only. So that's kind of gonna lower that one, most of my priority. One of them has the ability to push data and changes via API into your CrowdStrike, into your Active Directory, into your Carbon Black. Ooh, I should care about that one a lot more. So I haven't even yet started diligence in terms of an evaluating the weight and the risk of code. I am doing diligence by narrowing my focus so that when I know when I start doing what you traditionally think of as my code reviews, my stack and dynamic analysis, and whether I'm linking to static or dynamic libraries and how that risk assessment is done. I know I'm looking at the right thing instead of doing the right things at available targets. And those two are important. The when right we, thing on the right target. When we look at that, and you look at that function, if somebody were to say, wow, that sounds super interesting and I'd really love to do that job, who does that role in a, in a security organization? Uh, AppSec. AppSec will do that role. Um, the other team uh, that you might do this, you might find this in a security architecture because they're looking at the whole and are these blocks reusable? And if so, can we count on them being reused? So I would look in application security and I would look in security architecture first. Um, Devdel Zen comes back through, says, we'll loosen and branch out into S bomb as well. It would seem like they would be complimentary. That's a great question. So, uh, if you mean software build of material, if on the other hand, this is a competitor to the root drink, then we are not getting into the new traffic. <laughs> I was thinking software build so, materials as well. <laughs> I mean, S bomb does sound kind of like you know it's going to turn your brain on Guarina and Taro. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, okay, cool. Um, so, no, is the short answer. Not yet. 
What we're after now is assets, identities, and data. Where I expect we move to next is moving deeper instead of wider. So like one of the problems is I got so many good ideas, but I need fewer ideas that are <laughs> gooder, right? So I need fewer gooder ideas. Um, and so I agree it would be complimentary. Um, for us now, it would be distracting. For us a year from now, it might be too late. And that's the tension that we kind of live uh, in. So it's a really good question. How um, how hard do you just like we get back to that hustle mentality? We get back to, you know, you know, your your drive and your desire for Lucidum to be awesome. How hard is that push and pull for you to you see a question like this? Um, know that there's more that you want to do. There's so many ideas out there that you want to do. How hard is that that push and pull inside of you? So I uh, I actually kind of enjoy the push and pull because so if you're going to start a company, have a well selected co-founder. That's my the best advice to you. So my co-founder, he and I are complements with an E. That means we're opposites. We're like left and right hemisphere. And so he is not offended, distracted, or angered by me saying, holy smokes, Charles, I woke up this morning and when I was taking a shower, it occurs to me, did you know what we could do with Lucidum? We could, and he's like, uh-huh, uh-huh. You got it out of your system now? Can we get back to work? And, and so it works. So I get that spike of, ooh, what about? And then he, got, he gets the, yep, yeah, oh, wait. Go back to that fourth paragraph of your 72 paragraph screen, Joel. There was something there that I can use, right? So it works for us. Right. So it's, it's Neil, that helps me. If I had to not be me yeah. in order to not distract Charles, it'd be hard. That would be hard, but it's not a burden. Yeah. I, I think, I think that's, that's the hard part for me when I think about starting my own company, right? Is, is I see all these cool ideas, like, I'm not going to bring it up on stream. Now's not the right time, but I've literally been down a rabbit hole for the last week on something that I probably should not have spent a week, you know, you know, mentally sucking up, you know, my time thinking about <laughs> because I, I, there's so much cool stuff that's out there, man. I just can't help it. <laughs> Sometimes, honestly, Neil, it's kind of nice to feel like, like a balloon hanging out a car window going 30 miles an hour. Yeah. You know, just yeah. as all these ideas are gone, and then it's and then it's okay, right? It's yeah, you let it go. You get, you get it out of your system. You get it out of your system. Um, uh, yeah. Yerick Bolivar Bul comes through and says, "I'd like to know what Neil and Joel think about the cyberpunk version of the hacker world." I w is this a metaverse question? I'm not sure if this is like a a, a hint at the metaverse question. All right, if, if I were to interpret this as a metaverse question, Joel, what do you think about the metaverse? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sorry. I thought we already covered zero trust. Um, I, if, if cyberpunk is the, uh, the dystopian, uh, urban snow crash, Neil Stevenson kind of thing. Um, I'd love to know more about the question. This feels like an interesting question that I need a better handle on. Um, <laughs> yeah, let's get a, if, 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 if Yair is still in chat, let's get a, let's get a, a derivative of that question. Cause <laughs> I, uh, love it. I, I'm, I, I'm very, very uh, bullish on the uh, on the metaverse thing. I'm definitely uh, definitely bullish on the metaverse thing. Uh, so Tell me about your bullishness on the metaverse. I will. I will after we answer some questions. I will after after we answer right. some questions. Um, okay, Mr. Zuckerberg. The metaverse goes beyond Zuckerberg. See, no, see, you're gonna you're gonna pull me onto the soapbox. Like, you see that, folks? You see that, folks? That's Joel, Joel grabbing me by the hands and be like, "Come on, Neil, tell me something." It'll be fun. It'll, It'll be, be fun. fun. It'll be fun. Uh, Sweet Delight says, "At what point in your career are you no longer a newbie, or do you always kind of feel like that?" Love it, love it. So, um, if you ever. If I'm ever the smartest person in the room, somebody needs to take me by the hand and get me out of the two-year-old's daycare <laughs> because I've wandered into the wrong room. So never be the smartest person in the room. Um, always be the newbie. And let me tell you, uh, for the last two years, every morning I've woken up and I look at the list of things that I gotta do. And I, when I look at that list, I realize I am too stupid to do half the things on this list. <laughs> never done it before. I don't even know how to start. 
And so you spend your day scrapping and scrabbling and asking for help and spending more time than you expected on your knees, asking for help on all directions. And by the end of the day, when you crash, you think to yourself, okay, nobody died. I think we got through that. <laughs> and you wake up relieved, you so relieved. And you look at your list for day two and you think to yourself, I'm too stupid for half the stuff on this list <laughs> for two years for two years and it is the most amazing feeling to finally see what you are too ignorant to have known earlier and have a chance to do something, to learn, to grow. So if you stop feeling like a newbie, I translate that, right? So it may not be how you meant, but I translate that to how terrible would that be? Every morning I feel like a newbie. So what you're really saying is you shouldn't be asking this question, Sweet Delights, you should be trying to strive to continue to be the newbie in every room and get into smarter rooms so that you're always the newbie in that room. Uh, unless she's saying, I'm afraid someday I won't feel like a newbie. How do I make sure that never happens to me? Yeah. So I'm not sure which way to read this. Yeah. Uh, Amoeba says, Joel, if you could go back and change the internship, what would you change and why? Oh, holy smokes. I wouldn't change anything. Um, like that should have been a disaster <laughs> and it was not. Did you have one of those moments where you were like, I am not smart enough to do this? Oh, oh yeah. No, well, and think how unfair, um, it could be for somebody who's like, all right, I'll, I'll give this a shot. Go ahead, Joel. Take six weeks of my time and try not to turn me into an unemployable forever. <laughs> like it's, it's, there's, there's risk there. Right. So would I change anything? I, I, I feel like if I went back and tweaked with it, it wouldn't have been as good as it was. It didn't just happen. Like I said, it was 100% effort coming from the person that mm -hmm. joined. And uh, that made up for the days I couldn't. And then I gave 100% effort in the days when he couldn't. And it worked. It's It was great. So what would I change about the next one? Um, I would bring Nathan in to help me set up some more formal structure. For the next one mm. because that would give us who have seen both sides of this the ability to make better for the next person you you, you said something that i i want to capitalize on because i've said this before as well when people ask me right you, when people ask me like what would you change neil what would you change what would you change about your career what would you change about your decisions for this and you said it yourself you said i wouldn't change anything because i'd be afraid that the outcome would be different than what it is now and you actually like the outcome that it is how often do you find yourself, or I think a better question to that is, has that changed for you as you've come up through your career where, God, you thought at the beginning of your career, I wish I could go back and change this. I wish I could go back and change that. I wish I could go back and change that. And then now where you are, CEO of Lucidum, you know, being successful and building that company right where you want to be. And then you look back and you're like, yeah, I wouldn't have changed the thing. So, um, I mean, you know, I'm a Christian. And yeah. the one difference between the two, there's lots I regret. And what I regret is where I didn't listen to God. Those are the moments. And so that's like my dividing line. There's a stretch in life where I regret everything still that came out of that. And I would 100% go back and do it all over again. There are things that I'm in the, in the middle of that I think to myself, there's no value in this. I don't know why I'm grinding away at this. I just feel like my nose is getting smaller as it's being ground down. <laughs> and, and honestly... That's part of life, and I, I'm going to die never knowing yeah. certain things. Um, but I do know some other things, and that is work harder. Be busier. If you're not sure what to do, be active. Yeah. Get after it. Own it. Take responsibility for it. And don't make anybody else take responsibility. Like, be a hypocrite the other way. That makes a difference. Good points. Um Azul says, uh, how do you feel about volunteer work for experience? Is it an option for somebody uh, graduated with, with a cybersecurity degree without work experience since most internships require college enrollment? Please volunteer. Hugely helpful. It's helpful for you, and you will learn some things you can't learn any other way. Uh, go to the Red Cross, uh, for example. Um, go to uh, Children's Hospital. Go to the Ronald McDonald House. Go to absolutely go and volunteer because they don't have money 
That's why they need volunteers. And so there's a couple of things that happen when a company doesn't have money. Number one, um, they won't spend it on what you think they should. So you got to figure out how to be a hacker and solve their problems without spending their budget. Two, the individuals who are at that, probably a nonprofit, at that volunteer, they don't care. Like they're there to get their problem done mm -hmm. and there is no money. And so I don't have time to, right? So that means you got to learn persuasion. You've got to learn how to make behavioral changes attractive to people that don't want them to be attractive. And so volunteering, yes, it's good for you. And yes, it's good for all that other stuff, but it will make you better at your career because you have to learn how to do without. And once you learn how to do without, now you go to a place where people are complaining about the lack of budget and you're thinking to yourself, I didn't have a dollar last year and you gave me a hundred grand. Think what I can do with this. So please volunteer. It will make a difference in your career. I want I want to put a I want to put a hot seat question on you and this will be the last question and then we'll wrap it up for for tonight. Um, we talk about volunteering for experience. You talk about having doing doing this intern program with Lucidum for the first time. There's a hot debate in the the cyber community as a whole. We, you mentioned LinkedIn specifically as well as on Twitter, Infosec drama things like that that talks about paid versus unpaid internships. Mm. And I know that that's I know that that's a very hot topic across the board. When from your perspective, with what you've just been through, and I know you sat on both sides, you've been part of big organizations like Symantec, like Google, you know, like Splunk, and you've done Lucidum, which is you know trying to get to its Series A and trying to launch itself as a company. What's your take? What's your hot take on paid versus unpaid internships? Okay, um, so when I started. I was a, a forklift driver at a woodworking shop. So that's, that's the context that I'm, that I'm coming from. And I sought internships for what I got out of it. And what I got out of it wasn't, uh, I was making like 745 an hour uh, driving forklift. So what I got out of it wasn't $15 an hour. What I got out of it was exactly what I wanted. And there were some places that I didn't want to be paid because I didn't want them to tell me what to do. And I didn't want to be obligated to stay longer. There was one specific thing that they were gonna give me and I'll come intern you for eight hours on a Monday, but cost you nothing. Here's what I'm gonna deliver you when I'm done because I want that and that's my fastest route to it. So to me, you decide what is your remuneration from this. Now, if you're doing work that's valuable, you should be paid, but understand that pay isn't, it's got strings attached to it. And so understand what you're being paid for, why you want that pay and why it's worth your time. And that composite package allows you to make the decision. Don't just accept unpaid internship because they seem important and that'll be, it'll be good for me for somebody to tell me what to do and um, plan my future for me. Any one of those, set it to the side, put it in the box marked to be set on fire. <laughs> Anything that is, hey, this unpaid internship is I get to go and raid your drawers. I get to go and dig through your desk and steal things. And you're going to let me do that? Yeah, that's pay. That may be something that I would step up to do mm -hmm. in terms of unpaid internship. So that's kind of how I would evaluate those things. Awesome. Fantastic way to end. Uh, Joel, on behalf of my community, on behalf of everybody who watches this stream now or later, thank you so very much for gracing our team with uh, with your presence. You're always a joy to have here. Always a wealth of knowledge. Cyber Truth Bombs version 2.0. The floor is yours, sir. Love it. Anything you'd like to say to the community um, before I send you off into the green room? Happy birthday to the U.S. Marine Corps. And for tomorrow, thank you to all of our veterans. Neil, thank you for having me on and thank you for the lively, distracting discussion in the chat. It's a pleasure being here. <laughs> Absolutely. Joel, we'll catch up later. I'm going to send you off to the green room. You can go ahead and cut off and we'll chat later. Chat, thank you so very much for another awesome, awesome stream with our guest, Joel Fulton. You can hit exclamation point guest in chat. Get his LinkedIn's. Make sure you do reach out to, to Joel. Connect with him on LinkedIn. He, as you can see, he's very, very approachable and he wants nothing but the best for you in your career. Uh, lots of great things happening this week. Don't forget, we got Tea with a Hacker on Friday morning, as usual, as well as uh, Friday Resupply. Um, uh, Jack Reedy is going to be on with, with uh, Tipsy Cyber Friday night, obviously. Rolling into next week. 
Um, I forget actually what we've got going on next week, but I don't, I, I did want to make sure that I remind everybody again about November 29th, November 29th, 7 30 AM Eastern standard time. We're going to have Ben spring co-founder from try hack me, um, on the stream in the morning. We're going to be talking about try hack me. We're going to be talking about the advent of cyber. We're going to be giving away, um, a few, a couple, um, year long passes to, uh, to, to try hack me. Um, so not just typical one month vouchers here and there, we're actually going to be, um, um, you know, giving away year long, um, you know, um, you know, access to, to try hack my as part of that giveaway, plus maybe a couple other surprises that I can't really talk about right now, but maybe a couple more. Um, so that'll be happening on November 29th, 7 30 AM. It is actually in the video section. So make sure you go over there right now, set your reminder so that you are reminded when that one happens. Um, thank you, Josh, for reminding me, uh, tomorrow being veterans day, I'm actually going to be on two streams tomorrow. Um, I'll be on Jax's stream. Jack Scott, you know, we've had her on um, on the channel here before in the past. Amazing individual. She's doing a, a Veterans Day stream tomorrow. I'll be appearing with her on a Veterans Day stream. And then at 4.30, I will be on stream with Jerry over on his channel. So we're going to talk about some cybersecurity stuff over on, with Jerry and his fam. Um, tune into both of those if you want to uh, support us over there on those channels. Um, listen. I think those are awesome updates. Um, listen, I appreciate all you. Appreciate everybody. Really do. Um, that's it, really. We're coming up in the holidays. Um, you know, Thanksgiving's around the corner. Christmas is around the corner. Um, you know, optimal time for burnout typically happens around the holidays. Everybody's trying to push really hard for year in. Make sure you're looking out for each other. Make sure you're looking out for your wingman. Make sure you're looking out for yourself. Make sure, as Joel mentioned, you're identifying those warning signs for burnout. You're taking the time for yourself. Um, can't stress that enough. I had one of my team members reach out to me on a text message and they had to take some time off, you know, because they had, had hit a wall. Um, you know, it, nothing pains me more to, to see people push themselves and burn out. It's very easy to do in this day and age. So, you know, make sure you're taking the appropriate time to take care of yourself. And listen, whether you're on the red side, whether you're on the blue side, whether you're still deciding, keep learning. We'll see y'all on Friday. I got the outro going. <laughs>